Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. Tonight, get your Bibles out and go with me to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, if you find the Psalms in the, kind of in the middle of your Bible, head over to the Proverbs. Right behind Proverbs, you'll find Ecclesiastes. Tonight, the title of the message is, This is the End. This is the end. You could put a smile on your face about that, too. This is not a doomsday message. Notice we didn't go to Daniel or Revelation or anything like that. We're going to Ecclesiastes. I was reading through the book, The Pilgrim's Progress. It's a, a classic in Christian literature. Uh, an uneducated man had written it, and they were just amazed at the fact that somebody who was uneducated could write such a great piece of literature. And, and he follows... Really, a pilgrim's progress. A man, that's a name, Christian, is going through life and, and he's going through the trials of life. And as he's going, he starts to wonder if he shouldn't go back. Starts to wonder if he shouldn't regress. And he writes and he says, sometimes he had half a thought to go back. Then again, he thought he might be halfway through the valley. He remembered also how he'd all, already vanquished many a danger. And that the danger of going back might be much more than to go forward. So he resolved to go on. See, sometimes in life, when we look forward to the future, like this time in the season that we're in right now, when we look at 2015, a new year, or even a new day for some of us, well, we, we look at it with the eyes of fear. And yet, God has never called us to regress. God has never called us to go back. God has never called us to backslide or to stop. God is always calling us onward, and God is calling us upward with Him. And the Bible gives us clear direction, clear vision, clear wisdom. The Bible gives us clear understanding and, and encouragements along the way that God has great things in our future. Can you say amen to that tonight? See, because, because God wants us to look towards the future, not with fear, but with faith. God wants us to look ahead with expectation in our heart and, and, and not with discouragement or doubt. God wants us to get a vision that we can face each new day with a smile on our face. Why? Because this is the end. This is what we're going towards. This is what we're headed to. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Did you turn there? Verse number 8, a great verse in the Bible. I've been meditating on it for a while. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse number 8 says this. The end of a thing. Everybody say the end. The end. See, we're talking about the end tonight. The end of a thing is better. Everybody say is better. better. End of a thing is better than its beginning. Now this is contrary to the way a lot of times we think about life. A lot of times we're looking back to the good old days. A lot of times we're looking back to before we had the problems. We're looking back to before the market crashed. We're looking back to when we had our passion or when we had our health or when we had our purpose or when we had this or that. And we're looking back thinking, you know what, the beginning was way better. The beginning had to have been way better than this. I, I, you know, look at what, what we've come to, and I don't know, maybe God missed my prayers, or maybe, maybe God didn't get me on the right path, or maybe I'm doing something wrong. And we look at where we're at and where we're going, and, and we kind of look with, with, with these, these eyes of fear. And yet God is telling us something tonight. He says the end of a thing is better than its beginning. I don't know how you started out 2014. Maybe 2014 was a good year. Maybe it was one of those junky years that you wish that you could just put aside and forget that it ever happened. But in any event, we can both say with confidence that the end of a thing is better than its beginning. Why? Because tomorrow's a new day. Why? Because God is still on the throne. Why? Because Jesus is in our present and he's in our future and he's already covered the past. Are you listening tonight? And so the end of a thing is better than its beginning. Listen, you could live a terrible, horrible, worthless life here on the earth, but if you got Jesus, your end is better than your beginning. Some of you guys are getting a hold of this already. Look at what he says. The patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Now, it's very important for us to understand the patient in spirit. Why? Because you are waiting for the end because the end is better than the beginning. Better than the proud in spirit who says, I know it all. I, I know better than God. I know what I can do. I know how it is. I, I got this thing. And, and, and no, that's not right. See, when we lift ourselves up against God, Pride comes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a great fall. 
And so we need to understand in our lives that God is telling us something. God is leading us somewhere. God has a vision. God has a purpose. God has a plan. God has a destiny for our lives. And he's telling us, even though you may be going through hard times right now, even though you may be looking at the future with uncertainty, not knowing what's going to happen, where it's going to come from, how it's going to all play out, even though you may not know all that stuff, God is saying your end will be greater than your beginning. Church, you know what that means? means our best days are ahead of us. That means that God has great, mighty, wonderful things in store for our lives. That means that at the end of our life, we can put a smile on our face when we go to be with Jesus, knowing that our end is greater than our beginnings with God. God always goes in greater measure. Hallelujah. So I ask the question, why? God, if that's the case, why? Why is the end greater than the beginning. I mean, starting things is phenomenal, isn't it? Anybody, one of those people, you know, I, I know in my life I've done this a couple times. You started something out and you got halfway through a book maybe, but you really enjoyed getting going, right? Anybody, anybody like starting things? Okay, a couple of you guys are out there. All right. Yeah, cool, cool. All right. See, it, starting's great. Starting is wonderful. Starting is neat. Starting is, is passion. Starting is alive. Starting, you know, you get that thrill of starting something. And, and, and so I kind of ask, well, well, then why is the end better than the beginning? If starting is so great, then why would the end be better? A couple of reasons why I found from the Word of God. Let's have some fun in the Word of God tonight. A couple of reasons. Why is the end better than the beginning? First reason is this. Because God works it out for good. Because God works it out for good. See, if the start of something was good, but then it goes bad, God's going to work it out for good. If the start of something is bad, but you belong to the Lord, God's going to work it out for good. Why? Because God is good. Therefore, if God by nature is good, he can only produce good. Thank you. Some of you guys tracking with me. See, God is not going to produce evil, wicked, bad. Why? Because God is good. Therefore, if God is good, then there is no bad in him. Oh, we may not like some of the stuff that he does, but why does he do it? He does it for our good. See, you guys got this. You guys got this. Let's take a look at it in the Word together. Turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter number 8. Great verse in Romans chapter 8 in the New Testament. Romans chapter number 8. The Apostle Paul writes to the church in Rome, and he says this in Romans chapter 8, verse number 28. Romans chapter 8, verse number 28, he says this, and we know, everybody say we know. We know. See, when the Bible says we know, we ought to know this stuff. We ought to get a hold of that. We ought to highlight it or, you know, put a little dog ear on our, on our Bible. That way we can find this verse again. So that when we feel like we don't know, we can go back and say, no, I know. Because the Bible says so. The Bible tells me so, like the song says. And we know this. We know that what? We know that all things. Now, let me ask you a question. How many things? Does that mean some? Does that mean half? 99.9%? No, that all means all. So we know that all things, all things includes good things. All things includes bad things. All things includes indifferent things. Yeah, you could do with it or do without it. doesn't matter, right? So all things means all things. So we know something about all things. We know that all things do what? They work together for good. To those who love God. Now, anybody in this place love God? Don't you just love the Lord? See, if you love God, look at to those who are called according to his purpose. See, if you are a believer, if you are a Christian, born again, giving your heart and life to Jesus, then we know something about life. We know that all things as a Christian that we go through are working together for my good. Why? Because I love the Lord and because I'm called according to his purpose. God's going to work it out. Now, I heard about uh, the rug makers in the Orient, right? Have you heard about this? 
they, they would uh, have a master weaver, right, work in the loom. And there they are. They would get this massive oriental rug started. And they would get this rug going, and they'd be weaving the, this pattern in, right? And, and so they had some apprentices, and these apprentices would come along, and, and they would be working alongside the master weaver, and the master weaver would allow the apprentice to go ahead and work the loom. And so here they are, and they're weaving this rug together. And, and they're using different string, and they're using different things like that. Now, every now and then, something would happen. And they would use the wrong string or they would mess up the pattern as they were going because they weren't a master yet. They were still learning how to work the loom. They were still learning their craft. And so they, they, would, they would kind of worry a little bit. No, oh, no, I, I think I've messed up the rug. Maybe we're going to have to destroy it. Maybe we're going to have to start all over. Uh, I, I may, maybe it's just going to be ugly, you know. And so they would call to the master weaver and he would come over and he would look at this design he would look at what was going on in the loom and he would start to weave and he would start to move and he would start to make the pattern and he would work this pattern out as they go so that at the end of it all it was no longer a mistake but now those things that looked like they were going wrong those things that looked bad now he worked it out so it was a beautiful oriental rug see in our lives God is the master weaver and at times, you know, we may be doing something in life and we may do something wrong. Something bad may happen. We may grab the wrong thread. We, we, we might go the wrong way. We might be thinking we're going according to the pattern when really we got it wrong and we're doing the wrong thing. And yet, when you call upon the Lord, and when you love God, and you're called according to his purpose, and you say, Lord, here it is. God, I messed up. God, take my mess. God, God, something bad is going on in my life, and, and I may not be at fault, but God is still going on. When you bring that to the Lord, God starts to move, God starts to work, and God starts to take that and make it into a beautiful tapestry that all can appreciate. See those mess ups can turn into your message in life. God works all things together for our good. Some translations say, praise the Lord. Why? Why is the end better than the beginning? Well, because God works it out for good. Why else? Why else? Well, because of the outcome of our faith. Think about this for a second. You are a faith person. The very fact that you came to church tonight means that you're believing in God. And the Bible says that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him because we must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder. So there is an outcome to our faith. Now, the beginning of faith is great, right? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Sometimes our faith starts at a problem. Sometimes our faith starts at a trial. Sometimes our faith starts at a revelation, right? You never knew that, that you could have something from the word, and yet all of a sudden as you're reading, you had one of those aha, eureka moments where you, you just realized, you, and, and, and it was almost like God just zapped you, and, and wow, look at that. And the word just popped off the page, and it came alive to you. And all of a sudden, you started to believe God. Now, that's great, but the end is better than the beginning. Why? Because you're going to receive the outcome of your faith. Are you listening? See, if you don't expect to receive what you believe God for, then you're not in faith. You could say, oh, I'm in faith, and, and the start of it was great, and it was wonderful, but I'm not going to get anything. You know, I, I, I just don't see it happening. I don't know how God's going to do it. I don't, I, I don't know about that. You know what? I still got the symptoms. I still have the lack. I still have the need. They're still not coming around. We still haven't talked. It hasn't happened yet. We haven't reconciled. I believe in God, but you know... See, the moment you do that, you've canceled it out. But you have to cross over into believing God. You have to cross over into confidently expecting, I know that I've already believed, therefore I have received. It's on its way. It's just a matter of time. <laughs> See, that's what this is all about. The end is better than the beginning. Why? Because the outcome of our faith. Let me show this to you in the word First Peter. You're there in Romans. Turn back towards the back. To 1 Peter, if you hit Revelation of the maps, turn around, come back. 1 Peter, chapter 1. 1 Peter, chapter 1. We're going to read verse 6 through verse number 9. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse number 6. Look at what he says. In this you greatly rejoice. Now, remember, we're talking about the end is better than the beginning. So if it's better, then when you get to the end, you're going to be smiling. So in this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, if need be. 
You have been grieved by various trials. That's all of us. Listen, guys, that's every single person who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus. We, we've been grieved. There's things that happen in life. There's trials that we go through, pressures and problems and pain. Verse 7, that the genuineness of your, what's that word right there? Faith. That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes. See, your faith is valuable. Your faith is great. Your faith is the start. Look at, though it is tested by fire. See, we don't like that part. God, I don't, I don't want the heat. Well, God says then stay out of the kitchen, right? But, but you are a person of faith. Therefore, you got to get into the heat. And though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So when, when we... At the end of it all, when Jesus is revealed, when Jesus comes, there's going to be praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Next verse. Look at verse number 8. Whom ye have not seen, you love, though now you do not see him. Yet believing, there's that word, faith again, believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Why? Verse number 9. Here's why. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. See, in our life, we're going to be believing God for all kinds of things. And we're going to have to believe God in every area of our life. Listen, you cannot raise a family, have children, be married without faith. It doesn't work without it. You've got to believe God in his word. You've got to have the word of God for your marriage. Otherwise, you're going to get mad at each other and you're going to separate eventually. Because the devil's going to be coming against you. Your flesh, the selfishness is going to rise up. Pride will come in there and the wedge will be driven and you will eventually separate. But if you have faith, you can believe God that I love her as Christ loved the church. If you have faith, then you can believe God that I'm going to submit to him as the church does to Christ in everything. If you have faith, you can say I love them and I lay down my life for them. If you have faith, you can say I respect him and, and, and I can submit to him. With your children, you cannot raise children without faith. Why? Because doesn't it seem like it's such a struggle just to keep them alive until they're 18? I mean, I, I'm in there right now with you all. Those of you that have children under 18, and man, my goodness, every night, my, my, we're, we're sitting there praying over them, checking their breath in the middle of the night, you know? We thought that went away after they were a baby, but then they get older, and you, you're still doing it, you know? Still getting up, still losing sleep. So you got to have faith. you got to trust that God is able to raise your children better than you are. Yeah, you, he's given you the stewardship. He's entrusted them to your care, but at the same time, God, I, I'm giving them right back to you, Lord. I'm lifting them right back up to you, God. You, you got to take care of the heart. You got to take care of the life. You got to take care of the path. God, these are your children called by your name. They are disciples taught of the Lord, and great shall be their peace and their undisturbed composure. You, you got to have faith. You got to believe God. If you want to be successful in life, have a successful, prosperous life, business life, wealth, every endeavor. If you want to be successful, you've got to be a person of faith. And if you believe and you remain steadfast, patient, enduring, you'll receive the end of your faith. And eventually, at the revelation of Jesus Christ, eternal life, the salvation of your soul. Can you give the Lord a hand for that tonight? <laughs> Hallelujah. So why is the end better than the beginning? Because God works it out for good. Because of the outcome of our faith. Here's a good one. Because seeds produce after the labor of sowing. See, the beginning might be fun. Anybody ever planted a garden? Isn't that fun? I, I remember we had our kids, just speaking of the kids, we were out, all right, we got pictures of them holding plants and everything. Now, we, we just destroy plants. We kill plants. Our thumbs are not green. They must be like red or something like that because we kill everything that we plant, it seems like. We, we've had some success recently. Uh, we, we have a little kumquat tree that, that just blossomed and sprouted. Apparently, it loves the citrus and, and, and just loves us, and so uh, we're enjoying that right now. But really, you know, we haven't had much success, but it's a lot of fun getting excited and getting dirty and digging and planting, and, you know, eventually when something does pop up and you can eat it off the tree, you almost feel like you're closer to God because, you know, you're, you're now in the garden and there's nature and all that kind of stuff, you know, and you didn't go to the store for it, and, and, you, and you have that, you know, that purpose and that value. But, you know, even even though the beginning is great, the end is better than the beginning. And, and sowing seed might be fun and it might be good, but there's labor involved. There's time and there's a process involved. And the end is better than the beginning. Why? Because seeds produce after the labor of sowing. 
Now, we don't like labor. We don't like work. We don't like that strain and that struggle and that trial. But yet, if the end is better than the beginning, we will endure and we will be patient. Why? Because we're looking for the reward. I don't know of any farmers. And in my house, my housing tract is surrounded by farms. When I drive home every day, I get a living lesson from the Bible about farms. And I don't know of any farmers who sow seeds and doesn't expect something back in return. I don't know of a single one. They wouldn't have a fruit stand. They wouldn't have a produce stand. They wouldn't have anything in the supermarket. They wouldn't have a business if they did not expect something to come. In our life, it's no different. The end is better than the beginning because seeds produce after the labor of sowing. If we sow the right seed, we can have confidence that we're going to reap the reward. Are you listening? So what is the right seed? It's right here. As you declare the word of God, you can know that my future is going to be better. Why? Because I'm sowing the right seed. I'm sowing good seed. I'm sowing the love of God. I'm sowing the wisdom of God. I'm sowing the praise of God. I, I'm sowing my, my financial seed like the Bible says for me to do. I, I, I'm going to sow goodness into my community and into my family. I'm going to sow words of encouragement into my children, and they will rise up and call me blessed. I'm going to sow into my husband. I'm going to sow into my wife, and we're going to have a great marriage. I'm going to sow into my business sound principles of wisdom. That book of Ecclesiastes, the book before it, two Proverbs, you want to get some business savvy? Oh my goodness, you have the best Jewish business counsel you will ever have in your life. His name is Jesus. He can tell you how to do business right. <laughs> Hallelujah. And if you sow that right seed, you're going to get the right produce. You're going to get fruit in your life. Turn me to the book of Psalms. Back to the book of Psalms. Past Ecclesiastes, where you just were in the, in the Proverbs, you'll find the Psalms. Psalm 126, we were there this morning as well, Psalm 133, but we're going to go to Psalm 126. Psalm 126, and I want to take a look at two verses, last two verses in, in the Psalm, verse number five and verse number six. Take a look at this with me. I want you to notice the end, okay? How the end is better than the beginning. It says this in verse number five. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. Isn't that how we, we want to live life? See, the end is better than the beginning. Isn't that true? See, you guys may be crying right now. You may be in this place hurting right now. You may have come into this place sad, but I'm here to tell you tonight, lift up your eyes to the Lord. Why? Because those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. Look at the next verse. He who continually goes forth weeping. In other words, this may happen over and over and over and over again. Every day there's going to be a new battle. Every day there's going to be a new trial. Every day there's going to be a new sorrow. Every day there's going to be a new news report or something that comes up. But if you continually go forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing. See, that's the difference. You don't have any seed, you don't have any hope. Bearing seed for sowing shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You know what the sheaves are? That's the harvest. That's, that's the produce. That's the bundles. That's the abundance that God wants to bring into your life. But you got to sow the right seed, and then you will get the right produce. Can you say amen tonight? Amen. Hallelujah. God is good. Thank you, Mignon, and those two others for those holy claps in this place. Last one is, is the best one, I believe. And here it is. Why? Why? Why is the end better than the beginning? Here's why. Because our hope does not disappoint. Our hope doesn't disappoint. See, the world may hope, like, I hope God's going to do something. I, I hope it's going to happen. I, I hope I get something in the mail. I, I hope I find someone. I, I really hope that I can be something someday. See, that's how the world hopes. Our hope is different. Our hope as Christians is not based in, in this ethereal kind of cloudy thing, and maybe it's there, and maybe it's not, and, and I don't really know. No, our hope is a confident expectation. Our hope is knowing who God is, knowing the seed that we've sown, knowing what we've done, knowing all of the stuff, knowing that the end is better than the beginning, and therefore our hope is not like the world's hope. Our hope is a hope that goes on into eternity. We have this hope, the Bible says, as an anchor for the soul, firm 
and secure steadfast into the very presence of God. God himself is holding on to our lives, and that is our hope. Christ in us, the hope of glory. That's our hope. Our hope every day is not a hope like the world's where we say, oh, maybe it's going to happen. No, our hope is a confidence. Our hope is yes. Our hope is amen. Our hope is to the glory of God. Yeah. Hallelujah. See, what makes the difference is patience. Patience. You remember the verse, we started out with it, that the end is better than the beginning, and the patient in spirit better than the proud. See, that's what makes all the difference in life. If you can hold on to hope and you can be patient, if you can stay steadfast and immovable just like the Lord is, then it's going to make all the difference. Can you wait on the Lord? Can you wait on the fullness of time? Can you wait on the season and the fruit-bearing growth? Can you be patient for the seasons that God has? Romans chapter 5. Turn back there with me. Romans chapter 5. Such an encouraging word for all of us. We all need some hope. Romans, the fifth chapter. Gives us the process that leads us to hope. Romans chapter 5, verse number 3 through verse number 5 says this. It's talking about our faith, how we have access to the throne room. And verse number 3 says, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. In other words, when trouble comes our way, we get a smile on our face. Why? Because we know the end is better than the beginning. This may look rough right now, but on the other end of this, there's something good going to happen to me. God's going to work it out. I've shown the right seat. I know what's coming because I'm in faith. Knowing that, there's that knowing again. You ought to underline that. You might want to circle that. You might want to write the reference down because you ought to know this. We glory in tribulations knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. Some of your translations say patience. And perseverance, character. That's a godly character. And character, hope. Notice the process. Trial comes our way. Produces perseverance, patience. Patience produces character. Character, hope. Verse number five, now hope does not disappoint. Did you get that? Hope does not disappoint. You will never be disappointed when you have the hope that's a godly hope. Why? Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The Holy Spirit is the seal. He is the stamp. He is the guarantee on our life that God is all that he says he is and that he's going to do all that he said he would do. He was the promise that was poured out on the church. And now he is your comforter. He is your counselor. He is your guide. He is your hope giver. Why? Because God loves you and because you're called according to his purpose. And therefore, God's working on your behalf for good. You may be going through a trial right now that you're saying, Pastor, you don't understand. Understand? Listen, I don't and I don't need you because I know that God is on your side, that God is faithful, and that if you remain faithful, that the outcome of your faith is good. You sow the right seed, you stay in there patiently hope, and it's going to be better in the end. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Stick with God. Stick with the word. Stick with faith. The end is for your good. What did we learn tonight? Why is the end better than the beginning? Well, we learn because God works it out for good. Why is the end better than the beginning? We learn because of the outcome of our faith. Why is the end better than the beginning? Well, because seeds produce after the labor of sowing. We know that in the natural. It's the same thing in the spiritual. And finally, we know that the end is better than the beginning because our hope does not disappoint. Can you give the Lord a great big praise tonight? <laughs> Hallelujah. Be great. I want to talk to you guys about your life before you leave this place. So I'm going to ask nobody get up, no one leave during this time. Don't pass out notes or text or anything like that. Come on, give me a couple minutes of your attention. Very important. And I don't want you to miss out. It would be a tragedy if we came to this place and I had such a good time, praise and worship. Good time in the message. You laughed at a joke. It's all good. All fun. It would be a tragedy if we did all that and then you left this place tonight. Your heart wasn't right with God. You died and you ended up in hell and didn't go to heaven. You say, whoa, pastor, you got real serious on me. Yeah, this is a very serious thing. I have this moment with you right now. 
And I want to make sure before you leave this place that your heart's right with God and that you don't go to hell, but that you go to heaven. Now, sometimes people scoff at that and they, they kind of guffaw and they say, well, wait a second, hell, I don't believe in hell. You know, that's a, a fairy tale made up by parents to scare their children into being good. And, and, and hell's not real. But did you know the Bible talks about hell? It talks about it in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. Jesus himself spoke of hell. It's a very real place. And you're not going to avoid it just by saying it doesn't exist. It's like burying your head in the sand and expecting not to get hit by the wind. Listen, you've got to face the reality of it. And I want to make sure you don't go there. And I know you don't want to go there. And listen, God loves you so much. He doesn't want you to go there. Never intended for you or me. Made for the devils and the angels that rebelled against God. But we choose with our life where we end up, whether we go to heaven or whether we go to hell. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, I don't have to worry about that. All roads lead to heaven. Really? You know, that's like saying all roads lead to the moon. You can drive around the earth as long as you want. You will never make it. Jesus came and he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. See, it's God's heaven. Got to get there God's way. Can't get there your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. It's like driving around the earth trying to get to the moon. Not going to make it. There's one way you got to get to heaven. That's God's way. Now, sometimes people say, well, pastor, that's good news because, you know, I know God's way is by being a good person. I, I, I used to be bad, yeah, but I cleaned up my act. Now I'm good. And, 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 you know, my good really outweighs my bad. Now I've been working on my resume. And, you know, I, I think that God sees that and appreciates that. And he's going to let me into heaven because I've been a, a good person, been nice to my neighbors, given money to charities, gotten involved in social justice causes. And, and, and I've been good. Therefore, God's going to let me into heaven. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say how good you have to be in order to get to heaven. I don't see any grading scale in the back by the maps. I, I, I must have missed that line that you have to be above. Be this good and then God will let you into heaven. It's not there. Not anywhere in the Bible. Can't just be good and expect to end up in heaven. Because the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not going to make it based on your good works. In fact, the Bible also records that our good works compared to God's goodness are like filthy rags. What does that mean? That means they're going to get thrown out. Not going to make it. Today... I love you. I respect you and I honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it if you're trying to get there by being good. Now, sometimes people say, well, pastor, you don't understand. I was raised in church. My parents told me we were Christians growing up. Born in America, America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven. My, my parents had me baptized or christened as a child. They, they hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. Took you to religious classes like Sabbath school or Sunday school or catechism class. And, and you consider yourself to be a Christian. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that your parents raised you in church, tell you a Christian that makes you a Christian? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you wear religious jewelry, be baptized as a Christian as a child, or attend religious classes that you get to go to heaven? It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're born in America or that because you're not some other religion, that by default God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Come on, let's talk about your life. That's how you think you're going to get to heaven. Not going to make it. Some of you might be thinking, well, pastor, okay, I get that. But, you know, I, that was when I was a child. Here I am in church right now. I'm sitting in church, and I consider myself to be a Christian. And while that's great, and I'm glad you're here tonight, could, could you just show that to me in the Bible where you sit in church service, call yourself Christian, that makes you Christian? Not there. That's like me saying I could go to Dodger Stadium, wear a Dodger uniform, sit in the Dodger dugout, call myself a Dodger, bring my bat and my ball, and think that I'm going to get to play in the game. You know what's going to happen? They're going to find me sitting there, drag me out, and lock me up. Why? I'm not a member of the Dodgers organization. Can't just sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, and that makes you a Christian. Come on, let's talk about your life. Some of you said, well, Pastor, okay, I get that. I, I know that. I understand that. But you, you don't understand. My last church I got involved, I helped out. I sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I have been taught in the Bible classes, got a membership card to that church that I could show you. Great. Glad you did those things. Just show that to me in the Bible. Your church involvement gets you into heaven. Your volunteerism, where you help out, sing in the choir, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader, teaching the Bible classes, and you get to go to heaven. It's not there. God is not waiting at the gates of heaven looking for your membership card before you can enter. Come on. 
Let's talk about your life. What makes you think you're going to heaven? Sometimes people say, well, pastor, hold on a second. Yeah, I, someone told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I know God. I, I sing the songs at Christmas, just celebrated here last week. Uh, you know, celebrate Easter and the resurrection every year of my life. I, I could quote scriptures to you, pastor, Old and New Testament. Doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian because I know God? Well, if you'd read your Bible, you know the demons believe that Jesus Christ sent God. They're not Christians. Yeah, they believe, and they shudder, the Bible says. The devil himself is recorded as knowing who Jesus is and can quote scriptures out of his mouth. And yet he's not a Christian headed for heaven. So everybody look up here for a second. Look up here at me. It's not about what you have in your head. It's not about having mental assent towards God, knowing who Jesus is in your head. And you get right with God because you know him. But rather this is about your heart. God's always been after your heart. God sees the heart. He's looking at your heart right now. There's a man by the name of Nicodemus, a good guy, did a lot of good deeds. In fact, he was raised up in his church called the synagogue, considered himself to be a religious person, and, and became one of the religious leaders. In fact, he held to the strictest form of the religious law. He was a teacher in Israel. We would have went to him to find out about God. He could quote the scripture. He could debate the scripture. How many of us could do this? He could sing the scripture. And yet, even though he did all that, Jesus, when he's speaking to him, doesn't pat him on the back and say, Nick, man, hey, keep doing what you're doing. I'll see you in heaven. Rather, what does he say? He says, Nicodemus, you want to enter the kingdom of heaven? You must be born again. It's that simple. You want to go to heaven? You must be born again. Now, I, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They've raked it through the coals, made it out to be something that it's not. Some weirdo, goofy, radical, fanatical, crazy Christian thing, you know. They've portrayed it in Hollywood and movies and television and books and the internet as something that's stupid, something that we don't want to have any part of. Listen, let's not let Hollywood and books and movies and the internet especially define for us what being born again means. Let's find out from the Bible what does being born again mean. Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. Just that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. Last book of the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are pretty gross graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what's he saying? Lukewarm. What's that all about? Well, little in, little out. A little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and again, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Jesus made this statement. He said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, here's your opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three, and then I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You might be thinking, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Mm -hmm. You might be. Let's get over that tonight. Let's push past that. Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? And ever? No one would make that trade. Moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity in hell away from God? Come on. No one's that dumb. And yet the devil thinks that you are. That's why he's trying to talk you out of it right now. But listen, I love you enough to tell you the truth, not play games, and encourage you towards the things of God. You can spend an eternity with God who loves you. Your call, your choice. We you give God all of your heart? We you give God all of your life, acknowledging your need for Jesus by simply raising your hand or you sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right? Come on. Tonight is your night of salvation. All across this auditorium, who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand in this place? If you're not sure about your salvation tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand? Never done this. Never said yes to Jesus, given them all of your heart and all of your life. I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place. You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. 
ready to get your hand up and get right with God. Hands are already going up. We'll do it all together at the same time, man. I appreciate that. My goodness. Hey, let's do this. Hands are going up. You guys are ready. So let's do this. If that's you all across the auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you are watching by television, in the foyer, in the Love Rock Cafe, God watches. God sees where you're at right now. And you can lift your hand right where you're at online. Hey, God's watching you too. Get ready to get your hand up. Let's do this all together on the count of three if you need to. Need to get right with God. Come on, here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one. There's two. God bless you. Who else? There's three. Got you over there. On this side, where you at? Where you at? They're pointing over here. Gotcha. There's four. God bless you. Who else tonight? Four wise people already. Will you join them if that's you? Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? Listen, I didn't embarrass them and I won't embarrass you. Need to give God all your heart. Need to give God all of your life. Come on. And this is a safe and friendly place. Anybody else real quick? Come on. Just pop it up high when I'm looking in your direction. Come on. Going to give you another moment. Do you feel like your heart's beating out of your chest and you're wondering if you should do this? Yeah, you should. Go for it. Come on, God's speaking to you right now. Thank you. Number five, God bless you. Who else? Who else? You're saying, yeah, I need to. That's me. That's me. Let's go for it tonight. Anybody else that I didn't already see? Got five wise people already. Will you join them tonight? If that's you, just lift up your hand. Anybody else? Last call, I'm going to look your direction. Just pop it up high when I'm looking at you. Anybody else? Anybody else over here? In the center section on this side, anybody else? All right, well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for five wise people. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. Now, all five of you, or the five more, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Aren't I a greedy little preacher? Come on now. You know you should have got your hand up. It's not too late for you. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're going to stand. We're going to give a clap and a shout, sing a song. As we do that, once you get your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church, coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Once you get in the aisle and meet me up front, we're going to change destinies tonight. Can't do that till we get you down here. So if that's you, you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand. You come right now. Let's stand and welcome them. You just get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front right now. Come on. Come on. If you raise your hand, you should have. You come. They're coming. Let's give my hand as they come. I surrender all. From the family rooms, you can bring your children and come down right now. Come on, come on, come on. From the foyer, you can come into the church service. They're still coming. Come on, you can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. If that's you, you need to come. Just make your way to the front right now. Come on down. Hallelujah. Anybody else? They're still coming. Come on, let's give them a hand. Let's give them a hand. You can come too. You can come too. Come on down. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hey, you guys up front, look up here. This is the best decision of your entire life right here. Man, that's such a good, good choice. You guys are smart, all right? I want to encourage you guys, I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine. See this guy right over here to my right, your left? This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? Are they like to have hands like in a face or something? I'm sorry, that was this morning's message you had to be here for. That was a joke for everyone else. They missed it. So you'll have to watch it online. No, listen, as weird as I am with my jokes and stuff like that, he's cool, all right? He's going to do three things. He's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again, okay? Then he's going to give you some free information, some free literature to find out what to do next in your walk with God. And then he's going to introduce you to a friend we have here in the church that we like to call a spiritual personal trainer. Heard of the physical trainer in the gym helps you get strong, right? Spiritual personal trainer will do that for for you spiritually. They'll, they'll come alongside you for five weeks, teach you five things out of the Bible that'll help you get strong in the ways of the Lord so you don't go back to the old ways that you go on with God, all right? We all need a friend in life to encourage us and to help us. I didn't grow in my walk with God until I had a friend telling me, hey, this is what God thinks. This is what God says. This is how you ought to live your life according to God's word, okay? A spiritual personal trainer or an SPT as we call him will be that friend for you that'll help direct you the right way, okay? Then after he's done with that, he'll let you come right back out your friends and family they'll wait for you now listen I want to make a promise to you guys okay give us a year one year of your life here at the Rock Church World Outreach Center consistently sitting under the word of God and the teaching here at the Rock okay if you can get here Sunday nights get here Sunday nights 
You get here Sunday night and Wednesday night? Come on, get two services a week. Why not be crazy? Be radical. Get here Saturday morning or Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Women's Bible study on Thursday morning, Friday night, young adults. Whatever you can get, all right? Get a hold of the Word of God consistently for one year. At the end of that year and for the rest of your life, here's the promise. I, I promise to you guys that you will look around and say, my goodness, I didn't know I could be this blessed. I didn't know I could be this good. Am I telling the truth, everybody? All right, take their word for it, okay? So if you guys will make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God that I'm saved and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.